want to know the best Bird & Flight AF settings for your Nikon Z8 or Z9? You want to know how to set the menus, choose the best AF areas, and get the most from subject detection? Steve from Backcountry Gallery here, and this time around, we're going to take a deep dive and discuss field-tested Bird & Flight settings that will get you consistent, repeatable results with your Z8 and Z9 every time. And if you stick around to the end, I'll toss in some bonus non-AF settings that'll crank up your keeper rate even more. We'll start with some basic AF menu options, talk subject detection, and then move on to specific AF areas and usage. Also, the settings and techniques I'm about to share work well for me, but we're all different, so you may have another approach that works well for you, and that's totally fine. There is a lot of overlap with AF choices. Let's head to the custom setting menu focus section and confirm or adjust a few settings. I'm going to keep this section as brief as I can. If you want more detailed info covering the entire focus menu, check out my setup guide for the Z8 and Z9. The settings that follow should be enough to get you started though. AFC priority selection. First we have AFC priority selection and we want to set that to release. I know at first glance, you might look at this menu and be tempted to select one of the focus options instead, since it seems like we don't really want the camera to fire unless the subject is in focus. However, that's really misleading. There are frequently times when the camera has proper focus, but for a whole myriad of reasons, it can't confirm that lock at that very instant. If this menu is set to focus, for example, the camera won't fire. Release tells the camera to fire anytime you're pressing the shutter release, regardless of focus status, so you can catch all of those times where the camera may not have had a confirmed lock, but the subject was still sharp. The biggest trick is watching the subject in the viewfinder, and if you notice it has slipped out of focus, stop shooting until the camera locks back on. Yeah, you'll sort through more images at the end of the day, and yeah, some will miss the mark for focus, but it's worth it to make sure you're not leaving any great shots in the field due to an AF technicality. Focus tracking with lock on. Next, we have focus tracking with lock on. For the most part, I tend to set this around three or four, more rarely five or two. It really depends on the situation. Although, subject detection throws a wrench into this anyway, and we'll talk about that in just a few moments. First though, the idea with this setting is that it allows you to specify how sticky the camera is when something comes between you and the subject or the camera loses tracking, like when the subject falls outside the AF area. Basically, if the camera sees an immediate drastic change in distance under the AF area, like if a tree comes between you and the subject, how fast should it react? That's what this setting controls. The higher the number, the stickier the AF system is, and the longer it will wait before trying to refocus. The shorter the delay, the quicker it will look for a new target if it loses the current one. So, let's say I have this menu set to something like 4 or 5. If I'm tracking a bird and it flies behind a tree, this longer delay tells the camera to hesitate for a moment, giving me a chance to pick up the bird on the other side. However, if this is set to 1 or 2, the camera will quickly look for a new target when it sees that drastic change in distance, and you guessed it, it jumps to the tree. The same applies if I'm panning and I'm not keeping my AF area on the bird very well. With a longer delay, I have more time to get back on target before the camera starts looking for something else. With a shorter delay, if I lose the bird, the camera will try to refocus very quickly, often right on the background. At first, it seems like longer delays are the way to go, but shorter delays have advantages too. For instance, let's say you're trying to lock onto a bird and the camera hits the background instead. I think we've all been there. When that happens, what do we do? Yep, we put the AF point back on the bird and we press as hard as we can on our AF button, right? With a short delay, the camera will quickly jump to the bird. With a longer delay, it can feel like forever before the camera changes from the background to the bird. Of course, if you have a longer delay, you can release AF and try to refocus instead, but that's frequently even a little bit trickier. Additionally, shorter delays allow you to jump from target to target faster. For instance, if you're jumping from bird to bird with a long delay and AF engaged at the same time, you can move your AF point to the new bird, but it will hesitate for a moment before picking up the new target. A shorter delay will allow you to jump from bird to bird much faster. Yes, you can disengage and try to re-engage AF as well, but when quickly jumping from one bird to the next, I find that a short delay with AF continually engaged is more intuitive. So what's the bottom line here? 
if the AF system seems to be getting stuck and not readily jumping from one AF lock to the next, try a shorter delay. If it seems like it's falling off the target too easily, go for a longer delay. For burden flight work, most of the time, I'm pretty happy in the three to four range. If my camera ends up on the wrong target, I stop focusing and I start again. As a side note, 3DAF only uses a value of three for this setting, regardless of how you have this menu set. Auto is similar and only uses settings of three, four, or five. We also have a setting for subject motion, erratic or steady. This isn't if the subject is moving in an erratic or steady way though. What it refers to is if a subject is prone to sudden stops or starts. Usually I have this on steady, but if you're shooting quick landing and takeoff scenarios, you might wanna try it on erratic and see if it improves your luck. Finally, a quick note about subject detection with this setting that might make you not care at all about any of the previous instructions. Focus tracking with lock-on has minimal to no effect when subject detection is engaged. For instance, let's say you're using wide AF and subject detection has spotted and locked onto the bird. If a tree gets in the way, the camera can no longer see the bird and goes back to using wide AF the way it normally would, basically starting over and locking onto the first thing it can find, you know, the tree. That's not to say you should not use subject detection with birds, just keep in mind that there's not much of a cushion in some specific scenarios if the camera loses a lock. Focus point persistence. This one takes a second to wrap your head around. When focus point persistence is set to auto, if the camera is in charge of the AF area position and you override it with a button set for an AF override, it allows you to pick up the last AF point the camera was using when you pressed that button. We absolutely want that, so leave this set to the default of auto. Also, I think an example is in order because, again, this one is kind of confusing. Let's say you're using auto AF and the camera was on the bird and you have an override button set to go to, we'll say, single point AF. When focus point persistence is set to auto, your override AF area will pick up at the previous AF point where the camera left off. In this case, it would look at the AF point currently on the bird and pass it to our single point AF area and we're right where we wanna be on the bird. However, if this is shut off, instead the camera will go to wherever single point AF was the last time you used it and that may or may not be on the bird. Note that this only works if the camera is picking the AF point, like when it's using 3D or auto AF or when subject detection is enabled in auto, 3D, or wide. The reason we want this on is that it allows us to perform AF handoffs, which we'll discuss shortly. Manual focus ring in AF mode. If you're using a compatible Z-series lens, you'll see this option. If not, it won't be shown on the menu. If you do see it though, make sure that it's set to the default of on so you can grab the manual focus ring to assist as needed. If you shut this off, you won't be able to grab the focus ring and manually override when the lens is set to AF mode. Subject detection. Our next stop is to turn on subject detection, at least for starters. You can do that through the photo shooting menu or via the AF area mode slash subject detection option on the eye menu. If you're shooting birds in flight, the decision is easy, set it to bird. Also, it's usually a good idea to at least start with subject detection on. For most birds, it's better with it on than with it off. However, if you find it's not working well for your particular situation, don't hesitate to turn it off. One place where people can get tripped up with this is not knowing when subject detection is working and when it's not. Keep in mind that subject detection is a refinement of your current AF area. For instance, in this photo, you'll see the wide AF area with a little green box on the subject. That green box tells you that subject detection has taken over and is only focusing on that small area. If instead the entire wide AF area is lighting up and you don't see the little green box, then subject detection is not engaged and the camera is just focusing with wide AF. For auto AF, just look at the number of AF boxes. If it's more than one, subject detection is not engaged. I hear people claim that subject detection is working in auto AF because they see all the little boxes flitting around, but that's not the case at all. If you see more than one box, auto AF is just working as it normally does and subject detection is not engaged. For 3D, it's trickier since there's only one box, but you can usually tell because the AF area changes size as it adjusts to the face, body, or eye. 
The reason I bring all of this up is that it's important to know if subject detection is engaged or not, and if it is engaged, how it's interacting with your subject. For example, if subject detection is going to the wrong place on the bird, it's better to shut it off. Take this scenario for instance. Let's say you have a bird flying toward you at about a 45 degree angle, and subject detection is going for the body instead of the face. In that situation, you'll discover every single eye is out of focus and every shot is a miss. Ask me how I know. In that case, it's much better to shut subject detection off and use the AF areas normally. I usually pick something like wide, small, and I try to just keep it on the head as the bird flies. In addition, the effectiveness of subject detection lies in large part with the panning skill of the photographer. The better you are at keeping the bird in position in the frame, the better subject detection is going to be at sticking to the face and eye area. If the bird is all over the frame, subject detection simply is not going to stay where you want it as well. Also, subject detection works best when it can actually see the bird. Pre-focusing at about the same distance as the bird, or maybe just a little in front of it, helps subject detection to lock on much faster and avoids the camera locking onto something else. Finally, if you're shooting a subject that's a bit far away, I notice that subject detection tends to work slightly better with Nikon cameras if you switch to DX crop mode. I want to stress this though, that's only for distance subjects. For normal distances, do not switch to DX mode. Before we get into AF modes and AF areas, I wanted to take a few seconds and mention my wildlife setup guide for the Z8 and Z9. What you're learning in this video is only a small fraction of what's covered in that book. If you really want to get the most from the AF system and all the systems in your Z8 or Z9, make sure you check it out. In addition, take a look at my bird and flight book as well. It's one thing to know the camera settings, the bird and flight book will show you how to apply them in the field. AF modes and areas. First, let's make sure the camera is set to AFC mode. I know, this is pretty basic stuff, but if you've not done bird and flight photography before, this is a potential tripping hazard. AFS is for focusing and locking in a specific single set focus distance, and that's not what we want. AFC allows the camera to continually follow the subject as it moves. For bird and flight, it's AFC all the way. Let's talk AF areas and when to use them. For most of my bird and flight work, I'm setting my primary AF area to auto AF or some implementation of wide AF or wide AF with a handoff. Now, when I first started using the Z cameras, I favored wide AF with a handoff to 3D. Basically, I'd use my wide AF area for my initial lock and when I saw a subject detection engage, I'd press my FN1 button, which is programmed for 3D AF. Thanks to setting focus point persistence to auto, the camera would hand off focus to 3D. With 3D AF, I was no longer limited to just the wide AF area and I could have the bird anywhere I wanted in the frame. The idea was that I really wanted to shoot everything in 3D, but the tiny 3D AF area wasn't very easy to get on target and the larger wide AF areas are. So I started with wide AF to get on target, waited for subject detection to engage, and then I handed that off to 3D AF. However, over time and firmware improvements, I'm finding nowadays that I'm often just using auto AF and not using any kind of AF override button or handoff, and that works well most of the time. I think this is in large part because of the new bird mode and subject detection. Let me tell you, it's nice not to have to worry about playing the AF override game. Just set to auto AF and shoot. However, it's not perfect, and the trick is knowing when to use auto AF and when to revert to wide AF or wide AF with a handoff. I tend to use auto AF and subject detection when there aren't too many distractions that will cause the camera to pick up the wrong target. The first thing I do with auto AF is to ensure my focus distance is at or about the same distance as the bird, usually with just a quick turn of the manual focus ring. This takes advantage of the fact that auto AF likes to grab onto the first thing it thinks is a subject, especially with subject detection enabled. Most of the time, it grabs right onto the bird and will stick to the bird no matter where it is in the viewfinder. If you skip the pre-focusing step, you risk auto AF just grabbing the first thing it sees and it drops the effectiveness of this technique significantly. However, auto AF is less than ideal when there are multiple birds in the viewfinder as it will tend to jump around from one bird to the next at times. It's also tricky when subject detection is not really seeing the bird due to some tempting obstacle in the environment or if subject detection is getting a false positive for what it thinks is an eye, like an old knot in a tree branch. There's also times auto AF is more interested in the bird's body than its head. 
In those cases, few as they are, I often switch to wide small or wide large and work to keep those areas on the head, sort of limiting where subject detection can wander. However, if subject detection is still working against me, I'll just shut it off and I'll do my best to keep the AF area on the head as I pan, usually the wide small area. So what about wide AF? For general shooting, where subject detection is doing just fine with the bird, I often use wide large, wide small, or if I'm shooting a bird above obstacles like other birds or grass or something, a custom wide AF area that's narrow and long and looks a little bit like this. I like to use wide AF to restrict the camera's attention, like those times when I have multiple birds or multiple targets in the frame and I don't want auto AF to pick the wrong one, or when there are lots of elements in the frame that auto AF might lock onto instead of the bird. Basically, anytime I'm fighting to get auto AF to lock on or stick with a proper target, I switch my primary AF mode to one of the wide options. I often use wide on its own, with or without subject detection, and the trick there is making sure it's in a good position in the frame. You want to keep the wide AF area on the head as much as possible, even with subject detection enabled, and you want to use the smallest area you can successfully keep on the bird as it flies. The smaller the AF area, and the better you are at keeping it on the head, the more likely it is that subject detection will find the face and eye and not stray to the body, which may or may not be on the same plane of focus. The other technique I like to use with wide AF areas is the handoff. Basically, it's like what I said earlier. I get my initial lock with wide AF, basically helping the camera so it selects the correct target, and then I hand off to another AF area by pressing and holding a pre-programmed AF override button. As mentioned, at first I use 3D for this purpose, but lately I'm finding I have even better success handing off to Auto AF. As long as subject detection is on the bird, the risk of handing it off to Auto AF is minimal. When subject detection is enabled, Auto and 3D basically work the same way following the subject all over the viewfinder. From a tracking and focus standpoint, there's no difference when subject detection is engaged with either of those AF modes. However, there is a difference when subject detection loses the target. Anytime subject detection loses a target, the camera reverts back to the normal version of the AF area that's currently in use, even if what's in use is an AF override. This is where auto AF often has an advantage. Let's think about a couple of examples, assuming the override is still engaged since this happens fast. In other words, your normal AF area might be wide AF, but you're pressing an override button, so now it's 3D or auto AF. Now, let's say you're overriding using 3D AF, and suddenly subject detection no longer sees the target. The camera will revert back to 3D AF, but 3D AF by itself is only slightly larger than a single AF point. Plus, the chances are, if subject detection lost the target, it's probably not near that little 3D AF area anymore. This means it's likely to try and focus on whatever is under it, like the background. On the other hand, remember that Auto AF tends to grab onto the first thing it thinks looks like a subject, and what's important is that it's looking at the entire viewfinder. So if subject detection loses the bird, there's still a very good chance that the focus distance is still close to the same distance as it was when we lost our bird. When Auto AF takes over and starts looking at the entire viewfinder, the first thing it'll notice is that bird regardless of where it is. Since it's sharper and seems like it might be a subject, there's a strong chance Auto AF will lock on. Once it realizes it's an actual bird, subject detection will probably re-engage, but in the meantime, at least the camera didn't try to jump straight to the background. Now, technically, if the lapse in subject detection is just a split second, 3D would likely jump right back to the bird before trying to focus on something else. However, I have found that Auto seems to offer a little extra security in this scenario. And of course, if you need to, you can always just release the override button, go back to wide AF, and reacquire the target. Button programming. So you might be wondering how I program my AF override buttons on the Z8 and Z9. Let's head to my office and take a quick look. So let's head to the custom settings menu. We're going to go down to controls. And what we want is the option for custom controls with shooting in parentheses, as you see right there. We're going to go in here, and this is where we can program all of our various buttons. Now, for this video, we're mostly interested in just the ones that we're going to use for burden flight work, for autofocus work. And straight up, I'm going to tell you, I don't do a lot of programming in here. The truth is, when it comes to autofocus areas, I know that some people like to throw every single 
autofocus area they have on every single button that they have and I just don't do that. I am very Spartan with it. For the most part, I try to have the correct autofocus area to begin with and I only have like this one override here for FN1, but I do have some other stuff I wanna talk about. And also, we're gonna demo this with the Z8 rather than the Z9 because the Z8 just got firmware 2.0 and it added a really cool way to switch your autofocus areas. I'm gonna show you how I have that set up as well. And finally, before we dive into this, I want to emphasize that just because I do something a certain way doesn't mean you have to do it the same way. Sometimes people get a little bent out of shape. They're like, well, I don't do it this way and my way is better. Whatever works for you, man. I just it, Whatever works, it's great. I'm going to show you how I do it. I hope you just use this as a starting point and customize your camera so it works well for you, not just to mimic what I'm doing. And oh, by the way, I'm also updating my Z8, Z9 setup guide. So kind of ignore the rest of the buttons in here. I've been playing with stuff and nothing is really where it should be except for the autofocus stuff. So with all that out of the way, let's look at FN1 and that is set to change AF area mode. Now, I don't use the AF area mode plus AF on option very often at all. As a matter of fact, in this camera, I don't have it set up at all. And the reason for that is I like to control autofocus. I use back button AF and I like to be able to say when the camera's focusing, when it's not, even when it's in an override mode. And again, this is something that there's controversy about. Some people think that it's crazy to use just a straight AF mode and have to press another button. I don't find it all that difficult. So, you know, do whatever works well for you, but I like to have control of that autofocus. And as far as the AF area mode goes, I have it set to auto area AF, just like we talked about a few moments ago for those reasons, I prefer to override to auto AF. So that's the first one there. Next we have FN2, and I have this set to access the top item in my menu. So I'm gonna give this a press, and you can see where that is. It's kind of midway here on the menu here, you'll have to scroll down to find this. And the reason I do it this way is the top item in my menu is subject detection. So this allows me, I'm gonna demonstrate it, I'm gonna go back to just live shooting mode here, and I'm gonna press my FN2 button, and what's gonna come up is my AF subject detection options menu. And again, that's because it is the first one, if I go down to my menu, you can see that the top item there is AF subject detection options. So when I press FN2, it automatically goes to that menu. And the reason I like that is because I can come in here, I can switch from birds to animal, or I can come in and shut subject detection off if I want to. Right now, we don't have a toggle way, a push button way to shut subject detection off other than using recall shooting functions. Technically, you can do it with that, but I have that set for something else, which I'll show you in a moment. So I want a way that if subject detection is not working, that I can come in and shut it off. As I said, I think that's very important. Sometimes it's great and other times it just doesn't do the job. And if you're finding that you're fighting subject detection, make sure you just come in and shut it off. And I think this is probably the easiest way to do it. And I have this again assigned to FN2 on my camera. So let's jump back over to our setup menu. And let's look at a couple other ones here. So I'm gonna go down here a little bit. As you can see over here, I have AF on set for my back button because I'm using back button AF. I don't think that's a big surprise to anybody. Let's go down here a little farther. And this is a big one here. This is brand new on the Z8. This is called Cycle AF Airy Mode. I am confident the Z9 is gonna get this sooner or later, hopefully sooner, because this is really cool. What this does is it allows you to just toggle from one AF area to the next just by pressing the button repeatedly. And Sony's had this for a long time and it's very, very quick. In fact, it's pretty much eliminated the need for a lot of the AF overrides we used with Nikon before simply because it is so quick to jump from one to another. I do wanna emphasize it's not a replacement though for overrides like when we were looking at handoffs, you still need the override button to do that, that kind of stuff. However, if you're like in the wrong AF mode, it's no longer a big pain to press the button down and hold it and turn a dial until you happen to come across the right AF area. Instead, you can just press the button there real quick and it'll toggle straight through it and you can be at that other AF area in just a second or so. And the really cool thing is once you get used to this, you'll be able 
to know how many presses it's going to take to get from one AF area to the next just by looking at the AF area that you're in. So if you're in wide, you know, if you press two or three times, you get to this other AF area. And it becomes very, very intuitive, very, very fast. Let me show you how to set this up. I have mine on the video record button, mostly because if I am shooting something and I need to change AF areas, I'm probably not going to keep shooting that thing. I'm going to let my index finger up and give it something else to do. It kind of gets bored just pressing that shutter release all the time. So this gives it something else to do when I don't really need it. So let's go over here. And you can see cycle AF area mode is up towards the top here. You can see we didn't scroll down very far to get to it. And we have some options here. And you can come in here and you can just select the ones that you want. And I'll show you the ones I've selected. I have single point AF on this. I have some wide AF areas on it, small and large, my two favorites. I also have wide AF area C1. That for me is set to a one by one AF area. It's like single point, except the difference is that this can use subject detection. Wide AF can use subject detection and single point can't. So this gives me like single point AF with subject detection. It basically allows me to shoot like I would with single point AF, but be a little bit lazier. So if I'm not quite on the eye, for instance, it'll still kind of stick with the eye and it won't go, you know, focusing in front of it or behind it. So it's a nice little thing to have there. And I do enjoy having that. And I also have 3D and auto programmed here. Now, let me show you how this works. I'm gonna go back to shooting mode and just watch this. As I press the button, watch what happens to my AF areas. They just flip right through there very, very quickly. I can jump from one to the other almost instantly. It doesn't take any time at all to do that. So this is why I like this toggle option so much. Let's go back to the menu. And again, I find that that's a really good one for the video record button because you're, again, your index finger is not doing anything else at that moment. So what about Z9 shooters? What should you do? Well, how I've had this set is how I still have it set on my Z9. Let me show you here real quick. We'll use the Z8 to do it because it's the same feature. But basically we're going to go all the way down to our push and turn options. And we're looking for focus mode and AF area mode. And basically that's gonna work just the way it always has. You're gonna press the button down and you're gonna turn your command dials to change your focus area or your focus mode. So unfortunately the Z9 does not have that neat cycle trick yet, but I'm sure that's going to be very popular. I'm sure Nikon's going to do it eventually, hopefully sooner rather than later. But this is how I have my Z9 set up. Now with the Z9, because you cannot switch AF areas quite as fast as you can with that cycle option on the Z8, because of that, you might have a few more overrides that you want to program into. So maybe on the FN2 button, you want a different override. Maybe you want 3D on that. So you have auto on the top and 3D underneath it there. So there's a lot of different options there for you. But uh, for right now, this is, this is as good as we get for the C9. Also, I've had people ask me, why put the AF areas, AF modes on the video record button since the focus mode button down here, if I could find it, does the exact same thing, right? Well, here's the problem. Not only is that in a bad place ergonomically as far as finding it, but if you're a wildlife shooter, a lot of times you have a big lens hanging off the front of the camera. And if you're hand holding, this button is pretty much impossible to use safely, at least safely for your lens mount. Because think about it, you're gonna have one hand right here, then the other hand's where? It's holding that big lens. Where are, how are you going to get to that button? You have to let go of that big lens and hold the camera like this with a big 600 hanging off of it. That is not good for the mount. So that's why I put it up here because it's a little bit safer. And honestly, I think it's quite a bit faster. Next, let's go back up here over to the display button. And I currently have this set for recall shooting functions and I'm using the hold option here. That means when I press the button, I don't have to keep pressing it. The camera's gonna hold my settings. So let me show you what I'm currently using. And if shooting functions hold, and you can see where it is here in the menu, not too far down, not quite to the middle there. And if we go look at our options here, we have shooting mode and shutter speed. We have all these different settings that we can put in here. But basically what I'm using it for is to switch between bird and animal mode for subject detection. And that is way down here. We go to AF subject detection options. And most of the time I have my camera set to bird. So I want this set to the opposite. So when I press the button, it goes to something different. In this case, it's gonna to go to animal. So if I go over here, I can press the right side of my multi-selector and I have all these options here and I could pick animal, bird, whatever, or I could even have it shut off if I really want to. And I used to do it that way, but I'm finding that it's actually slightly more useful for me because I encounter a lot of mammals and a lot of birds, more birds than mammals, but 
but it seems like I have more need to switch between bird and animal mode than I do to shut subject detection off anymore. And again, that's a tribute to Nikon's improved firmware, I think. But anyhow, I have this set to animal and I have my normal subject detection set to birds. So when I'm out shooting, if I am shooting birds, I'm great. I don't have to do anything. If I happen upon a cute little squirrel or raccoon or something, all I have to do is press my display button and it will change over to animal and optimize itself for that. And the thing is, a lot of times people try to use birds with mammals, but the thing is animal works well with mammals and birds, but birds really works best with birds and I have it's very hit or miss with mammals. So you definitely wanna be changing that if you're kinda of in a mixed situation. And again, I have this on the display button and hit menu button for done. And that's pretty much my settings in there for autofocus for birds in flight and things like that. So this is basically what I'm what I'm doing here. This last one was a little bit of a bonus, but I think it could be kind of handy for you as well. So let's move on. Other settings. Finally, I wanted to mention my general non-AF related settings for bird and flight work. Again, see my bird and flight book if you really want to learn this stuff, but what I'm about to share with you will definitely get you started. For shutter speed, I generally start or try to start at about 1 3200th of a second. However, it really depends on the situation in the bird. Here's a chart of safe shutter speeds that should help. The better you are at panning, the more you can use the speeds to the left. If you're just starting out, the speeds at the right are probably a little safer for you. For aperture, I tend to shoot wide open, although that does make it harder since there's very little room for focus errors. Still, I like the look of a wide open shot and it helps to tame those busy backgrounds. For ISO, I like to keep it under 3200, but that really depends on the shutter speed and f-stop that I have to use. If I'm filling the frame, I'm willing to go to ISO 6400 or even 12800 if needed. However, if an image is going to require a heavy crop, I do my best to keep the ISO to 3200 and no more than 6400. My guiding principle is that I'd rather have a sharp but noisy image than a clean blurry one. For frame rate, I go to the max on the Z8 and the Z9, 20 frames per second. This not only gives me more chances to get a sharp photo, but more importantly, it gives me a huge selection of wing positions. For exposure and metering, I usually go full manual mode, setting my shutter speed, f-stop, and ISO myself. I keep ISO on my lens control ring so it's quick to adjust. Sometimes I'll use manual plus auto ISO if the scene isn't too tricky, but I find that full manual mode seems to work well most of the time for bird and flight work. I hope this video has helped and I hope you'll share it with your friends. Be sure to stop by the site and sign up for my free email newsletter. It comes out about once a week and often has exclusive articles just for subscribers. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.